Welcome to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today, we're mixing it up and chatting with Rachel Hundley, an attorney and mayor of the city of Sonoma. We are going to chat about being a lawyer, starting a food truck business, and running for office. There is tons of great stuff to come in this episode. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience, so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the Catapult Conference. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. So welcome back. Today we are talking to Rachel Hundley. Rachel has a really fascinating story that we are excited to share with you today. She is an attorney who, after living the law firm life in New York City, eventually landed in the California wine country city of Sonoma. Not long after relocating there, she started to get involved in local politics, first getting elected to the city council in 2014, and then unanimously being voted mayor in 2016. She also co-owns a catering truck called Drums and Crumbs, which is a great catering truck name. I love that. (laughs) It makes me hungry hearing about it. So welcome, Rachel. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So, you know, as I live in the Bay Area, I spend quite a bit of time in Sonoma County, and I will admit... I learned about you, though, not through the mutual friends, of which I'm sure we have some, but by you being profiled in the Washington Post back in January. And we loved it because there was a great shot of you wearing your nasty woman shirt (laughs) in the (laughs) article. Um, And Allison and I were really taken by your journey from kind of being a New York City lawyer to, um, you know, a smaller town uh, mayor. So can you tell us just a bit more about yourself and how you ended up in Sonoma running for office? Sure. Well, it's it's all uh, been an adventure for me. I hadn't really planned out any of this. Um, even moving to New York was a bit of an experiment. I, w- I went to law school at the University of North Carolina, and in interviewing, I had focused on Atlanta and D.C., but on good advice from a friend, I tried a, a New York firm and ended up getting an offer from them after I graduated. So I thought, why not? Maybe I'll check out New York City. So I, I moved up there and worked for a a large law firm. Started practicing in 2008, which was an interesting time to get involved in that scene. That was the year I also joined the big firm life. It was an interesting time. Five months later, everything starts melting down. But I I hung around for a few years. And, you know, while the, the economy was melting, I was also starting to realize that that path wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. It was very exciting while I was in my late twenties. Uh, New York City was an incredible place to live, but I started pondering what else I wanted to do, and I settled on the idea that I wanted to try my hand at opening a business. And in f- deciding what kind of business it wanted to be, I eventually settled on food because food is something that makes everybody happy. It makes me happy. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Especially really good food. It's true. And so that was why when uh, eventually I got laid off from that law firm, and instead of getting another uh, lawyer job, I took up a job at a cupcake shop in the Upper East Side with the thought being that if I really wanted to hang my own shingle, and at the time I thought I was going to do a bakery, I thought I needed to see what it looked like from the inside. Mm-hmm. So spent six months making minimum wage, selling cupcakes. And by the end of it, I was convinced that that was exactly what I wanted to do. That's awesome. But but it could, I knew that New York wasn't going to be the place where I could do it. I didn't have the money to open a, a business in a large city. Mm-hmm. And I also knew that long term, I wanted somewhere that was going to be a little, little slower, a little quieter, and m- more particularly with a, t- a tighter knit community. So in serving my world of possibilities, fate led me to beautiful, perfect Sonoma, California, <laughs> which is just where I ended up moving. That's awesome. And if you love food, Sonoma is a good place to be. It is. That was part of my uh, the attraction to it since I wanted to, to have a food business. I thought that people would appreciate it there. And I had in the back of my mind um, for a while the thought that maybe one day I wanted to get involved uh, with local government. I've always been interested in the local economy. That's partly why I wanted to have a business. I love the local community. And local government is something that 
people don't spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about, um, particularly, you know, the elections and stuff like that. But when it comes down to the decisions that local governments are making, I mean, these are the things that affect people's everyday lives. Right. How long, how long your commute it is, it, it affects what kind of businesses you get to patronize. And so I knew I was going to do it when I was older, but uh, little did I know after I moved to Sonoma, fell in love instantly. Um, and then the next year, it ended up being an election year. Hmm. And I had started going to meetings just to educate myself on what was happening. And uh, rumors started circulating that one, maybe two of the uh, sitting city, city council members weren't going to be seeking re-election. And even though I didn't know anything about running for office, it sounded like two empty seats was something that I probably wouldn't see again. Yeah, but that's so, true. So I decided that um, in, in talking to people who had done it before, a lot of them said that, oh, you run once, you lose, but you learn a lot, and then you run and maybe you'll win. Mm-hmm. So I thought I thought that this was going to be my practice round. <laughs> Your dry run. <laughs> so, so even though I'd lived there for uh, one year when I decided to, to, go, for, to, to go for city council, um, I decided to dive in. And you said in your Washington Post article that you Googled how to run for office. Did you really Google it? <laughs> I did. I, I, don't, I didn't know anything about campaigns or elections. I had never volunteered on a campaign. Um, my family growing up was not very political. We never really talked about politics. So this was an entire field that the only things I knew about were, you know, what I'd seen maybe like on a movie or on mm-hmm. TV. So I, I knew that people had some somebody called a campaign manager so I, my, my new best friend, uh, David, who worked in marketing, that seemed like a useful skill. I talked, <laughs> talk, <laughs> I talked him into being my campaign manager. Of course, he knew even less than I did. <laughs> so together, we turned to Google and to, to see you know, what, what, what we were supposed to be doing. That's pretty awesome. You know, one of the things Allison and I talk about that law school does teach you is it teaches us how to learn things, you know, that we're quick studies when it comes to picking up new skills. So I think it's great that you just decided you had to learn how to run for office. So you just went out and (laughs) figured it out. Absolutely. And there is a lot and there's growing uh, information out there now. I mean, thank God for the internet, but there's, there's enough resources out there that at least point you in the direct, right direction. That's true. And I think there are even organizations, maybe not as many in smaller towns, but in larger, larger metropolitan areas that are supporting, especially women running for office. You know, Emily's List and organizations like that. Sometimes I think they do informational sessions to try and help people learn more about running for office. Oh yeah, there. Are, now I know. Now that uh, I've already gone through my <laughs> campaign experience, I've right. learned there are amazing organizations in the Bay Area. There's Emerge, and maybe one of the they all. One day I'll go through these programs to, to, you know, actually learn what I was supposed to do the first time around. But there is a lot of support out there. And, and especially now that people are talking about it more, there's far more help and resources than I had any idea existed when I was going through it. So do you think that the 2016 election has really spurred people to talk about this more, that people are starting to see local government or elections in, in general as more of a calling, as something that they need to consider stepping up to do? I'm amazed at the the response that I've seen, um, you know, especially in January around the time of the Women's March, everyone could feel this energy growing. And even in Little Sonoma, we had 3,000 people turn out on our plaza. That's amazing. Uh, f- for the Women's March. Yeah, it was incredible. And, but the way people were talking about it, it's, you know, everyone was hoping that this, that it wasn't just going to be a one day thing, that it was going to keep going. And Suddenly, I think people who never thought about being a politician are now realizing that that there could be a place for them, you know, even at the local level, to to help make good decisions for the future. Mm-hmm. And I'm hoping that now that if people can see that there's, especially at the local level, that the people that run are very normal. Like when <laughs> people think of politicians, they think of these, you know, federal cartoon characters we see on tv but when it comes down to who's running for your city council it's just they're just normal people right it's your neighbor almost literally you know exactly (laughs) (laughs) so other than having to learn how to actually run a campaign uh, what do you think was your biggest challenge uh, when running for office my biggest challenge uh, was the fact that i was brand new to the community 
so not only did I need to convince them all that I was you know, smart enough for the task, they had no idea who I was mm. because they've never even heard my name before. Right. So my, my biggest task was getting my name in front of as many people as possible so they would know who this option was that was on their ballot. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so how did you do that? Did you, I mean, was it door to door? Was it going to events? How did you kind of immerse yourself in a community? Because you had to do it pretty fast. It, it was a very uh, quick process. Uh, usually um, city council campaigns, I think they are maybe three to six months in smaller towns. It's a little on the shorter side, but mm-hmm. I used the full six months, but I had, the, the first step that I did when I decided that this was going to be the year is that I scheduled meetings with every, each of the five members on the city council, mm-hmm. and I asked them about what they did when they were campaigning, why they wanted to run, what were the issues that they saw to be the most significant. And then at the end of each meeting, uh, which was always, always, always over coffee, I would ask them for a list of names of people that they thought I should talk to. And... And then after those meetings, I followed up with all of the recommendations. And these ended up being all sorts of community leaders, Mm -hmm. people who were executive directors of nonprofits, people who had been involved in government in the past. And I spent uh, a couple of months going on uh, tons of coffee dates, like so much coffee. (laughs) Sometimes it'd be like three coffee dates in a row. And by having these one-on-one conversations with these people, I got to, to meet them uh, and kind of grow a relationship with them. And I always ask them at the end, oh, who do you think I should meet? So after a couple of months, as far as the community leaders and, you know, the super connectors, I had a pretty good handle, hand, hand on who they were. Mm-hmm. And then when it came to getting my name out to the rest of the public, um, I heard that knocking on doors was something people did. So yeah. I made up, made my own little flyer on Microsoft Word and then <laughs> literally started knocking on Every single door. Yeah. <laughs> Which uh, I learned only at the end of the whole process that you can be a little more strategic when you're knocking on people's doors because not everybody is a registered voter and not Got everyone's it. a likely voter. But I was just on the ground every day just knocking on doors. And half the time they'd open the door and be surprised I was standing there. And then mm-hmm. I'd get to tell them what I was doing. And all, almost always they were very pleasantly surprised and excited. I only had two people slam their, the door in my face. That's pretty amazing, actually. Yeah, it was very positive. I love your story about networking, because one of the things kind of tying this to a lot of our listeners who are, you know, maybe beginning their legal careers, we talk a lot about informational interviewing, or just going out and meeting people and trying to become part of the legal community. And I love that you had, you know, a very specific ask for everyone that you met, that it was like, now that we've made this connection, who else should I talk to? Who could you introduce me to? And that specific ask, I think is so important, because then they get to help you, but they know how to help you, because you're, you're kind of asking them to, to do this thing. And then that's what you need. And if you follow up, you're really building on each networking experience. It was a very effective way to uh, start and build relationships. And even now that I'm on the inside, um, I've been in elect office for about two and a half years. There's still people that I met that first round mm-hmm. that I that I meet up with, you know, maybe every couple months for coffee just to keep the relationship going. Yeah. And and having one in one one on one conversations in a, a quiet place, you can learn so much more about somebody and it's a very like comfortable environment rather than, you know, walking up to someone in a, a networking mixer and trying to have some sort of memorable exchange that, you know, probably neither person will remember that much about. That's true. And some people get so intimidated too by those kind of group networking settings, being able to just do it one on one, the, you know, you might not meet as many people, but the impact is going to be so much greater. Definitely. Yeah, I think that's, that's fantastic. So in Sonoma, you're on the city council. And so how do you become mayor once you're on the city council of Sonoma? So Sonoma, like, a lot of small cities in California and really around the country, we don't have an independently elected mayor. Instead, we pick our mayor from the existing city council, and it's a vote from the council itself. Um, and in in our situation, uh, it's there's been it's usually a tradition of you know the vice mayor ends up being the mayor that the, the year later. 
But what was a little bit different about my year is that I was not the vice mayor <laughs> last year. <laughs> so it ended up being kind of a shift of um, what the council majority was. We had a, a new city councilwoman elected uh, in, in November, who is actually an, also an attorney. And when she was elected, it, 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 there was, there was a, a shift within the council of, you know, what the majority you know, values were. And that's how it ended up being me. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a huge honor. Sonoma is such a special city. And I mean, everything that I get to do as mayor is amazing and um, very unique in many ways. But just being able to represent an entire community as Mm -hmm. their mayor has been an incredible experience. So I think a lot of people probably don't even have an idea of what a smaller town mayor does. So what do you do in this role? I mean, I'm sure you, you know, go to events and you might cut some ribbons or things like that. But, you know, I mean, what do you do as the mayor of uh, of Sonoma? Well, there certainly is a lot of the sort of public outreach PR side. I get to go, you know, give tours of City Hall to sixth graders. I get to visit high school classes. Um I get to go speak to a lot of different groups. So as far as a platform to share the message that I want to share, it's, it's, it's an unlimited opportunity. And it's, it's, and when anyone reaches out to the city for comments on things, they always start with the mayor first. Mm. So I get to have this um, public podium to share the message that of the future that I see for the community but then behind the scenes, um, I'm also the, the main contact point for people in the community that are having issues, um, developers that have a particular project they want to bring to town, organizations that have projects that they're trying to do or trying to build a coalition somewhere. So there's a lot of behind the scenes, um, more networking, but also connecting pieces for each other. Mm-hmm. Because since I'm in the, a part of the city now and I've just been able to learn about all the different pieces – Often people come to me with a problem and I don't necessarily, uh, I'm not the one that fixes it, but I know the person who can. So then I'm just pointing people in the right direction. And then sometimes they need, you know, a little extra support from the city, maybe a letter, maybe need to show up and advocate for funding for a homeless support program or um, other projects like that. And then... And the other thing that the mayor does is that I get to lead the the meetings. Right. And our agenda setting process is so that anyone on the city council can put things on the agenda. But the person who runs the meeting definitely gets to have a little more say-so in what we talk about, how we talk about it. And I I enjoy it, particularly when we have contentious issues. Since I'm the one running the meeting, I get to help foster a productive conversation of you know, a lot of public that have strong emotions about something, right. city uh, city council members that might not agree. Yeah. And so be so being the one running the meeting, I get to you know use, help find a co- uh, some coalition between the councils so that we can agree enough on something to to vote in a certain direction. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you think your legal training has helped you kind of step into this role? Oh, it definitely has, and I think that I think every city council would benefit from having an attorney on board because at, at the fundamental of it is we, we pass laws. So right. <laughs> we, we are definitely involved in the legal world. And then so many things that the city does is related to contracts or project agreements or memorandums of understanding, or you deal with issues like property rights. And when you're looking at land use and there's, you know, the, the legal elements are everywhere and for people who aren't attorneys, they have to rely almost entirely on our city attorney to help them understand what's happening. Right. But I, I feel like I have a huge advantage because I've, you know, I already have a deeper understanding about how the whole system works. Yeah. I think Allison and I talk a lot about how the law can be a great foundation for, you know, starting a business, which you also have done or, you know, and it, it does sound like with local government too, because I'm sure that being a lawyer helps you with all your businesses because there's a lot of law that goes into <laughs> starting a business oh, as we quickly learned. <laughs> certainly, yeah, business formation. I ended up having a, a bit of a trademark dispute when I registered my trademark. I had a 
a certain company come after me to try to block it. So I got, I, I was able to, to fight that battle by myself. But the other part about law school that I think is incredible is just the, the critical thinking skills that are honed while you're there. Mm-hmm. And so when I'm looking at, you know, a, an ordinance that we're thinking about passing or a problem that we're having and trying to figure out what the answer is, you know, the, just the ability to, to, to pick a part, a problem apart and, and, you know, examine each piece individually it's not a skill that everybody has that's true i think that is true and i think you know law school does think teach you how to think like a lawyer which can can be effective some people find it frustrating because it can be very linear but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, my it, boyfriend it, probably thinks it's frustrating <laughs> i know right I, I don't think anyone who is in a relationship with a lawyer does not find thinking like a lawyer frustrating my parents were lawyers i remember being the kid of a lawyer and Oh. <laughs> trying to win an argument in my house was like it was a no-go situation <laughs> oh i bet um so what advice would you have for our listeners who are getting inspired by this idea of getting you know involved in local government because one of the things i think that's fascinating about what you did is a lot of people think they have to you know if like i live in san francisco if i want to get involved in local government you know i guess my my thought is well i guess you know, you have to be in the city and where you have your roots. But what I think is great is you, you know, you kind of had this goal in mind, but then you chose your community and then said, this is where I'm going to invest. And then you just invested very quickly. And clearly the voters saw it and appreciated it. It's true. And different size cities will have different hurdles for getting in, you know, San Francisco, you'd have to start from a, probably a, a more visible place or at least have enough connections to have the the fundraising. But I don't even think that's an impossible task. But the beauty about smaller communities is the elections themselves have smaller budgets. I mean, Sonoma has this brilliant campaign finance reform already in place that limits um, how much we raise and spend. And I think it makes it very accessible. That's kind of amazing. Yeah, we, um, they that one year they had somebody come in and try to self finance a campaign and they spent so much money but lost it, wow. everyone was so upset afterwards that they just decided to to make our own campaign finance report for reform but but even with budgets it, it comes down to you need to be able to you know reach the people in your community mm-hmm. um, the magic number of people told me was that they need to see your name seven times so okay. that's why you get into things like mail and you get people to help you make phone calls mm-hmm. and I I, I had 25 signs, but that was only because that was all I could afford because <laughs> uh, the the fundraising part was a little bit challenging just because I was so new to town. Right. But there's and and be, even um, before you know thinking about the elected level, there's also so many um, appointed ways that people can get their foot in the door with the the, the community or the city and either learn more about what's happening with the city, or maybe they would enjoy that level. I mean, for example, I'm doing planning commission interviews right now. The planning commission is the the group of people that every single development project that, that wants to come into the city, they it goes before this commission. So they, I think they have even a, a bigger effect on the face of the city than yeah. the city council does sometimes. And there's, there's a lot of different kinds of, we have a cultural and fine arts commission, we have a design review and history, so there's, and these are all appointed. Mm-hmm. So, and then once you're on one of these, then you can, your network builds that way. You get to learn more and then maybe you want to make a, the jump up to elected office. But then even outside of city things, um, you know, looking at the community of the whole, Sonoma has so many um, amazing nonprofit organizations and they all have boards mm-hmm. and they all have, you know, support teams and they are as every bit, you know, as visible and significant to what's happening in our community as the city council. So there's different like pieces that people can do if they want to be more intimately involved with the community. Mm-hmm. They can run for office. They could be appointed. They could work in a nonprofit. Right. Or or they could just be a educated citizen who keeps up with what's going on. If there's a particular issue coming before the city council, it is. It, it is always so wonderful when people show up at the meetings and have opinions on things or they write me letters or they send uh, emails, like right. e- even being an informed citizen, which I, I, I would say that young people are definitely in the minority on this one because yeah. most of the people I hear from are seniors. But 
there's a lot of different ways to to get more involved. I think that's something that we don't really talk about is the breadth of the reach of local governments. And and maybe that's because people are waiting longer to like buy homes in a lot of communities or things like that. But I think people do forget that, you know, if you're somebody who really cares what the buildings look like in your town, <laughs> then you should, lo- you know, find out how the planning commission works or things like that, because there, there are so many ways to get involved in even smaller towns. Um, like I remember reading a few years back in Sonoma, one of the issues that was up for discussion a lot was, um, you know, how many resorts get let in because it's, it's all it's got a tourism industry, right? So how many yeah. resorts get let in versus, you know, keeping, you know, balancing the hotels with what's there? What can the community support, you know, keeping the you know, the local balance. I mean, I realize you know all this, but I was kind of like, wow, these are some really complicated <laughs> issues <laughs> being presented to kind of a small community. It, it's true. I mean, we even, um, let's see, the things that are currently on board for discussion, uh, of course, there's cannabis because mm-hmm. Sonoma doesn't yet have a dispensary, mm. um, homeless services, uh, always infrastructure. Workforce housing is my biggest issue. We don't have a lot of rental housing here, which is a... a a huge issue for young people. Right. So young people are finally getting sort of organized behind that one. And then we even tonight, I have a, a meeting to uh, talk about immigration because mm-hmm. I'm on the immigration subcommittee. So there's, it's, it's pretty vast. The things that you get to, to learn about and hear about mm-hmm. just at the city level. Yeah. So for the listeners, I think it's just important to remember that no matter where you end up in your life, <laughs> there's a lot of interesting stuff happening at a lot of different local levels, no matter what the size of the town or the city exactly. or the community. So, you know, you've lived all over the country. You know, you mentioned you went to UNC for law school, right? That's right. And then you also went to, did you go to school in Georgia as well? Yeah, University of Georgia for undergrad. Uh, born and raised Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. So you've lived in the South, then you move up to New York, and then you make your way all the way out to California. So what have you learned by kind of in getting becoming parts of these very different communities because those are three very different <laughs> oh, like, communities are. and lifestyles <laughs> <laughs> it's uh which i i think california is the the perfect sort of balance of all sides i loved new york because of the pace and how uh ambitious and smart everybody was but i also love the south because of the sense of community mm-hmm. and um you know just people are just really nice so out here i think that there's you know, there's, it's progressive, but then you also have kind of a laid back attitude. But I found that, you know, everywhere that I've, I've lived and I you know, studied in Europe a few times, it's like the more people that you spend time around, especially extended periods of time that are different from you, it makes it a lot easier when you come across someone who has a different perspective to be more patient and understanding. Mm-hmm. So now, you know, I have people from all walks in the city that, that, are, that approach me about things that they feel very passionately about. I don't always agree with them. You know, sometimes there's a lot of you know, emotions behind it, but, you know, being able to, to take a step back and sort of consider that this person's the way that they look at the world is different from me. It, it, it lets me, I think, make, you know, more uh, thoughtful um, decisions about what to do about whatever it is that they're upset about. Yeah, I think that's really true. I think that's one of the benefits of of getting to travel or getting exposed to different people with different stories. You know, everybody's, we're also influenced by our story and what we've seen and where we grew up and where we went to school and where we've worked. It's, you know, it's important to be able to listen to people who all have very different stories. That's true. And they, uh, and there's, there's always like, you know, at least a few points of validity, even if it seems like something like, oh my gosh, I would never agree with that. But mm-hmm. then you can kind of look down into like where it's coming from. You're like, ah, oh, you know, that actually does kind of make sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's very true. And so you lived all over and then you've had a lot of jobs. I mean, I love the fact that you wanted to learn the food industry. So you worked in your, in the cupcake shop in New York. <laughs> um, but you know, I think one of the things that people really discredit is every type of job that you have in your career, I think you learn some valuable stuff from. I mean, I learned a lot from temping after college um, and working in a bunch of different offices. I learned a lot about 
what kind of boss I didn't want to be <laughs> to people. <laughs> I, you know, I learned a lot about how offices ran. I didn't really know how offices run, ran. So, um, you know, all these different experiences, do you think you learned valuable things? Not just about, you know, for instance, the cupcake shop you were saying, you learned about, you know, the food industry, but just the skills you learn from these different job opportunities. Oh, that's definitely true. I mean, any any customer service job, particularly the food industry, you you very quickly uh, gain people skills and customer service skills, and um, you know it's also another way to just interact a lot of different kinds of people. But I mean, other random jobs I've had uh, since moving out here, I've had you know other sort of legal ish jobs, but not directly practicing. Mm-hmm. And then even uh, for a while, I, I picked up a job as a paralegal because I didn't I didn't think I had time to work as an attorney. So I even worked as a paralegal for a while, which, Interesting. you know, one, it strengthened certain uh, skills that mm-hmm. I think, I think that if anyone's moving from a large firm and it wants to go out solo, you kind of miss a lot of the support skills that there's always someone else to do it for you. And then right. when you go out, when you go out on your own, you're suddenly having to like, you know, figure out what, how does the court system work? I don't understand how I file this thing. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that that first time I was in charge of filing something, and I just take this paper to my uh, <laughs> over to my you know secretary, and I'm like, "Hi, so they want me to do this," and and she's like, "Just give it to me." <laughs> she's like, "I'll have it ready for your signature," and then I'll, I was like, "Oh, good. So you actually know how to." Like facilitate me practicing law. Excellent. I have no idea. Basically. It's true. I didn't. I know. I hadn't had to. You know, even you know, calendar my own dates until I got out here and started. You know, doing smaller law. But you quickly realize, you know, if you miscalculate one of your calendar dates, then you could just ruin everything. Oh, I know. It's so <laughs> true. It's so true. Yeah, I think it's amazing the the lessons that we can learn. Um, oh, and I haven't even asked you. So, what kind of food is in the food truck? So my food truck, um, I have picked what I love and know the best, which is Southern food. Nice. So we are authentic Southern cuisine, and our specialty that we have become, we are the fried chicken food truck, and our specialty mm. is traditional fried chicken. Nice. And then we also have all the classic Southern sides, like mac and cheese and coleslaw and cornbread. And um, we don't – It's the, the truck is um, – Usually in San Francisco, but it comes up to wine country on the weekends for special events. And then we get to have, you know, desserts and pies and shortcake and all the wonderful things that came out of the South. (laughs) That you got to bring with you out to California. Exactly. (laughs) I think the the food truck industry is is also something that's been growing pretty quickly and changing. Um in almost every community where there's a big food truck movement. Um, why? Did, how did you decide to take your food passion into a food truck um, instead of necessarily a brick and mortar restaurant? Uh, that was, there's two parts to that. One was um, I ended up starting the business with my friend, Arthur, who is an old friend from New York who I convinced to, to leave the finance world and move across the country and, you know, throw our lives into this business. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, we didn't have the money to do a restaurant, to do a lease, build out a kitchen or anything like that. So we saw a food truck as being a more accessible entry into the food world. Mm-hmm. And we still have the vision of after th- this year, we would like to figure out how to get a second truck. We really need a second truck. And then eventually we'd like to have a, a, a brick and mortar somewhere. But then also the beauty, beauty of a truck is that it moves around. So whatever right. you think your market is, you know, we thought we were going to be more up here in Sonoma, but it turns out that a better market for us was in San Francisco. So you can migrate around until you find your home and then, you know, maybe then plant your feet. Yeah. And even, I mean, San Francisco, are you part of off the grid, which is, or, oh, which oh, is like yeah, community yeah. food trucks. Kind yeah, of. F- food trucks do best when they're uh, with their food truck friends because that way, you know, when everyone... they're part of a small community, <laughs> exactly. Because you know, as wonderful as fried chicken is, not everybody is going to want to have it. So it's better if there's like other options, so that when a group of friends comes, everyone can find something they like. But yeah, San Francisco, there's off the grid, and then there's several food truck parks like 
some uh, street fruit park. You have um, G Lounge, which is a new covered park. You have food truck stop. There's a lot of opportunities for food trucks, but there's a lot of food trucks too. It's true. It's, um, it's definitely gotten very competitive there. Yeah, well, it's great that it's it's going well enough that you are excited to get a second truck. Yes, I need to get one, and then my second truck can come a little closer to home. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, because <laughs> you got to keep yourself and your community into the fried chicken. <laughs> Make exactly. Make sure that, that Sonoma's <laughs> yearning for good fried chicken is met. <laughs> yes. So, you know, you and I were talking about this a bit before we started the podcast, but, you know, Allison and I have been talking a lot about how this is kind of a time when folks are really feeling a calling to take some sort of action if they're unhappy with um, how the world is, <laughs> which can be a very broad <laughs> statement. There's a lot happening in the world. Um, and I think, you know, for law students, I think it's interesting because we are starting to see the lawyers, I think, really stepping up. Um, you know, we did a podcast a while back with the lawyers who were at the airports when the first travel ban um, was implemented. And you know, it was the first time we'd read stories about lawyers being like chanted about or clapped when they walked in the room. <laughs> um, you know, it seems like every day when I read the news, I read about lawyers filing more lawsuits um, to try and create change or lawyers stepping into local government like you're doing. So I think it's an ex- it's, it's kind of an exciting time to be a lawyer uh, because I think we have a skill set to um, protect the people that maybe we think need protecting, protect the rights that we think we need protecting. Um, so what words of advice is someone who decided to get involved in the community and you know, kind of, as you said, like be able to, you know, be kind of a catalyst for change in a community with a vision that you saw? Um, what words of advice would you share with our listeners that want to kind of step up and maybe start looking down the road of how they can get involved and maybe make some change in the world? Yeah, anyone out there um, who's graduating from law school already has. Uh, we have some really uh, special skills and qualifications. I remember that day uh, when all the attorneys went to the airports and mm-hmm. remember being thinking that I was so proud that I was a lawyer that I day. Know. That you know, just showed that there's there's things that you know only we can do legally to help people. Right. But then, like I said earlier, like even the in the skills we gain. The, the ways that we learn to, to think about what's going on around us, to understand the issues. Um, I think it's important for people to, to use those skills also to try to make their communities better. And if people are, are thinking that maybe they want a, a path um, into elected office and maybe thinking about something higher like state or federal, I think that the, the local level, it's, it's a great introduction into this potential career Mm -hmm. and you get to see what it's like to be a public servant yeah and you know the and the connection that you have with the people you represent it's especially in a small city like mine it's very close and then you know it could be something that ends up being their calling and then there's always you know plenty of opportunities above that which we desperately need everywhere to have good choices in all of our elections right so that takes and that takes the right people stepping up and wanting to to put in the, the time to do it instead of just you know letting letting it be the people who always do it and those as we see are not always the best choices so right. I, I think people deserve to have choices for their elected officials and I'm sure many there's at least a few people out there listening that that maybe they are the person that you know, their community deserves to have I think that's a really good point. And I love the comment you made earlier, too, where you were saying that most of the people even you hear from as your elected officials are seniors who maybe have a little bit more time <laughs> because they maybe they're retired. <laughs> um, but that I think even as citizens, it's a good reminder for us all, myself included, is that we all have a duty to talk to our elected officials and help them govern. Because how do you know what we care about if we don't talk to you about it? That, that is absolutely true, and it's the, the most challenging votes are the ones where I'm having to guess what my community thinks mm-hmm. because I haven't received enough information. And I think a lot of people assume that either, you know, oh, somebody else is already commenting on this or someone are already is going to show up at the meeting, but that's not always the case. And for young people particularly, I mean, this is the world that we're inheriting. I right. think that, you know, your, your opinions are particularly valued. Yeah. And, you know, 
are oftentimes not being heard, I think, because you, I, I mean, I think it's hard because you get just a lot of people feel disillusioned by the process. A lot of people feel like that maybe some of their representatives don't represent them, but you have to to make them represent you. <laughs> you know I mean? it, it, it's true. And it's, and it's hard not to get a little, especially now, like a little bit jaded, a little bit cynical about it all. But I think that coming out of this, I'm excited to see what the 2018 election season is like, mm-hmm. because I think there's going to be a lot more energy and a lot more choice just because, you know, whether people have just finally gotten so fed up that they're just going to jump in there and do it themselves. I mean, right. I, I think that we'll, we'll finally have, you know, some real choices yeah, and hopefully energy, you know, like that was, you know, at the Women's March and things like that can really carry over to the like next election season. It's true. And for people out there who don't themselves uh, want to go through running for office, um, there are plenty of people out there who do that need support. So just mm-hmm. find somebody you believe in and they'll be so happy to have your help. Yeah, I think that's true. So are you a career public servant? Is this your calling? <laughs> I I will say that I have really enjoyed uh, helping the public in this way. I find the whole system fascinating. I do think that um, I'm up for re-election next year. It's uh-huh. going to be the end of my four-year term. So I think city council, I think, is probably a two-term job just because you have to see there's such a steep learning curve mm-hmm. during that first couple years. So I think I'm going to serve my city a little longer and I guess we'll just see what happens. Awesome. Well, um, well, we're thrilled that you were joined us and shared your story and I'm excited to see where you go from here. And will you have a glass of wine with me up in wine country at some point soon? Anytime. All right. Sounds good. We'll switch it up. Maybe we can have wine instead of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that sounds good. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. We're going to post, um, or we're going to list some resources for people who are interested in running for government uh, in the show notes. So, you know, if this is something you're chewing on, definitely, um, you know, get on some listservs and learn about organizations, get on some mailing lists, go to some talks, um, or hey, just Google how to run for office. You never, <laughs> never know. Uh, and maybe we have some of uh, the next great lawyer leaders out there uh, listening to this episode today. <laughs> and with that, we are unfortunately out of time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com, or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk soon. Don't forget to consider running for office.